Marconi's first ever year-round bourbon was an inspiration. It all had to work together. A blend of carefully selected ingredients, Texas-sized pot stills, and creative people determined to find the absolute best way to usher a new whiskey along. When you discover how it pairs with a meaningful moment, suddenly the feeling of drinking great whiskey becomes a whole lot more. Hey everybody, welcome to this week's episode of Whiskey Neat, Spirited Conversations with Interesting People. I am your host, Christopher Hart, and this week, this is week three, uh, third week in Los Angeles, we sit down with Cameron Monahan. Cameron Monahan, oh gosh, I don't want to spoil the episode, but what a pleasant surprise. What an awesome guy. This guy has been, fa- and we talked about this a little bit after the show, he has been famous since he was like seven years old. I mean, that's earlier than Justin Bieber was famous, right? I mean, his, his, his impact, his, his career spans two decades, and he is not even 30. Could not have been a cooler dude. Knows quite a bit about whiskey. I was quite surprised. I offered him either a regular rocks glass or a Glencairn. And before I could even say the word Glencairn, he goes, I'll, I'll take the Glencairn. I was like, oh, that's a little tip of the hat. That makes me think you know a little bit about whiskey. And he does. Uh, we stuck around after. We made a cocktail, had a few drinks. Uh, it was so interesting. We sit down with Cameron. We talk a little bit about Gotham. His role is as the first live-action Joker since Heath Ledger's death. We talk a little bit about, of course, Shameless, spending the last 11 years on Showtime. Uh, 11 years of your life uh, in a TV show that is, that is oh, for those of you who haven't watched Shameless, you got to watch Shameless. Uh, and of course, his time as Cal Kestis in the Star Wars video game, uh, and our hopes for what happens next with that character. For over 30 years, Signatory has been one of Scotland's premier independent bottlers, selecting the finest casks of whiskey from over 120 different distilleries. From big names you already love to your new favorites you've never seen, and even legendary closed distilleries. We call Signatory the single, single, single malt scotch whiskey because not only do its bottles come from one distillery, but also from one distillation run and from one single cask bottled without additives like artificial coloring and at cask strength. So when you pour your glass of Signatory, you're getting scotch in its most authentic, most natural form. It's the closest you can get to a warehouse tasting without boarding a plane. Signatory Vintage Scotch Whiskey is bottled in Pit Lockery, Scotland and imported by Total Beverage Solution, Mount Pleasant, South Carolina and must be 21 or older to purchase. Signatory is made to be enjoyed, but please, please, please do so responsibly. Please welcome, without further ado, a, 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 an easy conversation over a few drinks with the one and only Cameron Monaghan. Cheers. <music> Dude, thanks so much for doing this. I'm excited to see you. Pleasure. How's it going? Yeah. Very nice meeting you. I, you know, I've been following you your entire life. Weirdly enough, it, I guess <laughs> I guess that happens if you've been doing this for over 20 years. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, it, it, it's crazy to to it, it's over 20 years at this point, and um, it's a very strange thing to have your entire life documented. Uh, you know, all of your kind of like those embarrassing home movies and that kind of stuff is my life. Like it's been sure. uh, projected out in a way that it's, 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 it's amazing, but it's also like every one of your awkward phases have been uh, put on public. display. Yeah. Yeah. And you are, uh, I wouldn't say notorious, but you are very publicly a private person. So, yes. so to be in the public spotlight for the past 20 years, uh, especially through puberty of all things, it's uh, it's a lot. I guess I would I would say about that though is, to me, um, acting and performance and art is generally a display of vulnerability, and it's a um, it, it's it's a purposeful display of fault and and of those things that make us human. So the reason I, I'm also I tend to want to be private in my own life is that I want to be able to portray things genuinely and, and emotively within a project and then not have my own personal life really 
coloring the perception of that character or that thing you know it's for me it's like i would rather have a separation and to have those genuine displays of my feelings in on film and to not really have it in just it influence it yeah I, I, not to specifically there is someone that came to mind but there's a very uh a very similar situation of another actor who spent his life in the spotlight uh, and, and then uh, his personal life and issues with alcohol and that sort of thing sure. on display the entire time, right? Sure. So it does color your, I guess it does color your perception of them or their performance. It can. I mean, you know, there, there are people who manage to pull it off and have a, um, a less of a separation between their own public persona and their own personal life where they're able to do it in a way of like where it kind of can feed into it or something but for me i don't want my personal life to become some sort of narrative or something crafted or something that is a uh it's not a it's not, it's some not for everybody story that i'm designing it's just me and i'd rather just be genuine in, in like moments like this where we're talking but to not create like i don't know i, I some people I, I don't want to get specific about anybody. Sure. I did. Someone did come to mind. I was like, ah, I won't say it. But it, it's sort of like it's it's a thing of some people are very good at that, and I don't necessarily fault them for it. It's just not what what I desire in my own life. I'd rather have a bit of separation in my my personal life, and my family, my friends, my romantic relationships, that kind of stuff. But uh, cheers to that. Yeah. I think that's a great a great reason to get into the, what's in front of us. Yes, please. I'm excited about this. So uh, I know you know a certain man named uh, William H. Macy. Yes. A little familiar with him? I, and I'm seeing a couple of bottles of Woody Creek over here. Yeah. So he, uh, we, we went and saw him a couple days ago, and uh, he put in front of us what he has now uh, become a part of, and in particular, his rye whiskey. So I thought we could start with this. Mm. We can we can jump right into Shameless. Let's let's talk about the last eleven years of your life. And uh, man, I, I I'm so happy you're here. I'm excited. So, cheers. Cheers. Let's do this. So I actually haven't tried any of his stuff yet. So I'm really excited about this. He was leaning heavy on the the rye. I think, and I Ooh. I agree with him. I think the rye whiskey is definitely the the banger here. It's absolutely fantastic. Oh, that's delicious. So, uh, what, 27, 28, somewhere in there? 27. You've lived a, a lot of life in a very short amount of time. Yep. Uh, I actually didn't know this about you until I did a little digging. You were the kid in Click. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you were the the little asshole. You know, it, it's amazing. <laughs> it, it, it it's the power of Adam Sandler. How often I get click this many years later. Really, like it's it's one of my. It's still to this day one of the ones that it's like. Are you the guy from from Click? Um, yeah, I mean, it's. I, I love that movie. I'm, I was happy to be a part of it. What was the the if you at that age every acting experience. Mm -hmm had to have or acting job had to have some remarkable moment that that has stuck with you this entire time sure was, was there an adam sandler that that some moment on that project that just kind of i i think that um it was an overall tone with him that i found really fascinating and really admirable of uh he he still works with people that he's known since like middle school high school uh, a lot of the electricians, a lot of the grips, a lot of these guys are guys that he grew up knowing. And, and ones that he, from his very first productions, uh, he's been working with. And he still takes care of them. And he's still really, really good friends with them. And he, he treats the people that he works with as family. And understanding that genuine respect and the loyalty to the, the, these people, I, I found um, absolutely incredible. Um, he also just had really, really good food. <laughs> yeah. I remember, I remember just like eating like these, uh, he had this like pastrami truck come in that was just like, unre I didn't even know you could get really good pastrami really good in food. LA. And, uh, yeah, it was just, uh, he, he, he ran a set in a way of, you know, a lot of times your, your number one, uh, your, your, your lead actor in your project is going to be setting the tone. And he kind of taught me that it, you have you have a responsibility 
of, you know, when, when you're, when you've been working for a while, you're not just taking care of yourself. You're taking care of a lot of other people and trying to bring other people with you, I think is really important. And loyalty is really important as well. Well, I think that's pretty apparent in, in Shameless as well. I mean, you guys, you are a family. I mean, even, even off screen, <clears throat> I think you may have been the one to take the picture and post it, but you guys were like at a Christmas dinner table and you were like, sure. this is the only place I want to be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah like, like you guys are just, and Shinola, mm -hmm. right? You guys oh, yeah, are Shinola. super close. Oh yeah. Um, it's it just, it, it's nice to root for a show and root for the Gallaghers mm -hmm. and then to like see that off camera that y'all are really that close. Yeah. And we root for each other. Um, uh, you know, like Shinola, who you just mentioned, she's, uh, directing her first episode of Shameless currently. And, uh, this is the first time that she's directing and she's doing an absolutely fantastic job with it. Um, you know, I think that now that we're all coming to a, a close, this is our final season. We're all really excited uh, to see where we progress from there and to kind of, uh, I think we all want to continue finding ways of working with each other and uh, developing stuff and kind of keeping that going. I've got, uh, I've got a, an Irish whiskey I'm going to lay on you and then we can jump into the scotch. I know you mentioned that you're a scotch fan. We got a little something from Signatory from my favorite place, which is uh, Isla. Mm. A little peated whiskey. Nyla is my favorite as well. So I, I'm super excited about it, and we haven't even opened it yet. So I'm excited to get Let's to that. So we'll start with the Irish. In. Beautiful. Is this a uh, is this a pot still? I, I assume with it being Irish. Yeah. So Irish whiskey. Knowing them, you know that's a good question. I'd have to double check. What what, what is it? Which one? So is this it? is Waterford. It's a brand new yeah. Irish whiskey. Uh, so it's funny we talked about Brook Laddie. The guy that brought Brook Laddie back in the early 2000s uh, brought the distillery back, a guy named Mark Rainier. He left and started an Irish distillery. And I know the column still, the coffee still was invented in Ireland. I mm -hmm. don't know if it's actually a requirement. I think Irish is, they, they use column stills all the time. I know it's a, it's a legal requirement for Scotch to be pot still if sure. it's a single malt. Um, but this Waterford Irish whiskey, he's basically trying to prove terroir. So terroir is big in the, in the wine, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Whiskey's a little different. There are regions of Scotland, but they're more like stylistic regions, not uh, an inherent start. Or an, you know, the regions of Scotland, there's an exception for every region. So it really, there's a hot debate right now whether or not the regions of Scotland are complete bullshit. And he's basically trying to prove. So this is all organic, single farm, single harvest uh, Irish whiskey that, and there's different expressions. So you can literally taste the difference. Same equipment, same stylistically. But if it, so he's basically saying, if I do everything the same, if the equipment's the same, uh, but the only thing different is where the grain comes from, mm. this farm versus this farm. If you're tasting a difference, then it, that proves terroir. So his whole motive was this 100 proof Irish whiskey. All, uh, Organic and 100 proof. It's, it's beautiful. I um, I love about Irish whiskey. I don't know if it's like the unmalted barley thing or what it is, but there's there's something that always reminds me of um, like breakfast cereal in a strange way of like um grains. Like, yeah, like that 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 grain kind of it, it kind of reminds me of like special K or something like that. I don't know what it is, but it's it's why I actually I I generally if I'm not drinking Isla Scotch, I usually reach for an Irish whiskey like the Green Spot or something like that. That's usually one of my go-tos. You, you know you're tipping your cards a little bit there, Cameron. <laughs> yeah. Uh you're you're letting those people watching cuz oftentimes someone will say, "Oh yeah, I'm a whiskey fan. I'm a whiskey fan." As soon as we came in, you spotted the Glencairn. Yeah. <laughs> now now you're, you're listing actually one of the most well-respected Irish whiskeys, Green Spot. I mean, it's, it's one of my favorites, yeah. Uh, uh, Red Spot was released, I think, two years ago. It was sure, an insane, sure. insane. Yeah. And Blue Spot was just launched, too. So I'm uh, a fan of both the green and the yellow. I still haven't had a chance to try the red yet. I didn't like the yellow as much as green. Uh, green is still my favorite. So Green's my the original reach. one. But, I mean, that's also because, like, it, look, it, it's not, like, respected or anything, but how I started drinking whiskey is I started with Jameson. Oh, yeah. 
And um, going from just Jameson on the rocks, kind of just dumping that into, it's starting to drink that neat and starting to actually enjoy that flavor and going, oh, wait, I like Irish whiskey. Let me explore. One of the first ones was besides Red Breast, which I think everybody has to go through a Red Breast, is, was the green spot and being like, oh, wait, this is just like, this is any day I can pour this and I'm going to have a great time with this. Yeah, um, Jameson was, I think, gets a little... A little unfairly treated because uh, mm -hmm. it, it to me it's like the wild turkey 101 of irish it's not bad yeah, yeah. uh you want bad irish whiskey proper 12 is garbage <laughs> uh but uh jameson is uh is a if i'm at an airport or if i'm somewhere that just doesn't have a selection uh but they've got maker's mark or jameson i'm uh, i'm sorry is proper 12 the uh, conor mcgregor's yeah yeah <laughs> I love yeah. how you're you're calling out the one person who can definitively kick anybody's ass. Oh, in this for room. sure. He would. <laughs> and, and knowing him, uh, he probably would like immediately attack me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, it's 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 not. Uh, listen, I I try to be as honest as I can when I taste whiskey. No disrespect to him. Yeah. In fact, the distillery. That I did try it once. Uh, I I did think it was it was kind of it, it reminded me of like um the taste of pennies a little bit there was something shiny and thin about it very for, metallic for no, very metallic that's a very fair response yeah uh, but you know i i also don't know if he would particularly care i think he was only caring if people buy it so. I, I think he's doing just fine i, I think he's I, gonna be I okay think he's north of millions of cases sold so yeah. I, I, he's okay he's doing I think just he's gonna fine. be all right <laughs> uh definitely not because i said something um yeah, so Irish whiskey, uh, again, you mentioned Red Breast. Red Breast is one of mm. the all-time single at pot still. Sure. Yeah, absolutely yeah. fantastic. Uh, oh, man, dude, Cameron, I didn't know you were a whiskey guy. This is exciting. I am a whiskey guy. That's It's my go-to, you know, unless I'm like, I'm, I'm a cocktail person. I like to mix cocktails with dinner, but then I always go, once I eat, I'm going neat whiskey. That's the only only way I'm going to go. I like a good cocktail when we go. In fact, uh, Todd's wife laughed at me at 8 Row. You remember that one time? Uh, we get there to this bar. All I do is drink neat whiskey. That's every day, <laughs> all day. That's what I do. But when I go, they do a frozen gin and tonic. Okay. And I, growing up, I loved candy. So his wife... Like the, the, the slushy kind? Yeah, like the, okay. yeah. I mean, that's a dessert in a cup, right? <laughs> a little bit of alcohol in it. Uh, Todd orders a whiskey. Doug orders a whiskey. I ordered a frozen gin and tonic. Oh, frosé. It was a, actually a, a rosé, but, oh, sure. but frozen. Yep. And she laughed, and she's, oh, I thought you were joking. I was like, no, I'm not joking. <laughs> so his, his wife shamed me. But, um, dude, I, I, cocktails are great. I, I, I try to lay off the sugar the older I get. You'll get yeah, there. no, uh, of course, of course. Um, I, I do love that you try to lay off the sugar, and then you immediately went for a frosé. <laughs> well, see, here's the thing. If... If I get, I started with beer. If I get rid of beer, sure. switch to distilled spirits. There's no sugar in distilled spirits. Mm. Uh, every once in a while, I don't mind a margarita or something frozen, you know? Sure. I told Bill this. I think the most exciting thing in scotch right now is Signatory. This brand is doing all single barrel cast strength stuff. Is this cast strength? Oh, yeah. All right. 59.7. Give you a little touch there. Hey, cheers. Absolutely. You have a very artistic style to you, even in the way that you post. You love to take a good photo. Uh, the moment I heard that you got the role of Jerome and his brother, um, I couldn't help but, it, and I'm sure you've talked about this, but the amount of excitement for you to really spread your artistic wings had to be overwhelming, right? I mean, when, when you knew you were gonna be playing the inspiration for what would eventually become the Joker, mm. Uh, did it did it almost make you want to like not do Shameless anymore? Like I'm gonna like it's a it's a shiny new idea. I get to spread my wings and be something creatively. I mean your smile, right? Like everyone talks about how uh, uh, what was his name? Um, Jack Nicholson's smile, right? your natural ability to smile in that evil way mm. had to be just, I mean, how excited were you? Talk to me a little bit about what like was going through your head when you knew that you get to spread your wings a little bit. Okay, so first of all, this is absolutely delicious. So <laughs> yeah. I just want, I wanted to mention that this is beautiful. Uh, secondly, did that make me not want to do Shameless? And if anything, it's the opposite. Um, I 
the the actors that I enjoy, the artists that I appreciate, tend to be the ones who have um, contrast and dynamicism to their careers and to uh, their performances. It's like a, a Philip Seymour Hoffman or like a Gary Oldman or someone. These character actors who tend to personify a lot of different personalities and different um, uh, forms and tones and that kind of stuff and are able to kind of balance those things. And what was really exciting about a, a part like Gotham was that this character is extremely different um, it, than the, the Ian Gallagher character on Shameless. It, it, I, I was the first actor to touch anything related to the Joker, barring my, Mark Hamill and the animated stuff. I was the first person uh, in live action to, to touch the Joker after Heath Ledger's death. And um, I think that it was important to me to um, regard it with the same level of... Um, Gravitas. Yeah, I mean, just just respect. I mean, this is sort of like, kind of like a modern day uh, Richard the Third or Hamlet or something like that, where this is a this is a character that is portrayed by um, a bunch of different respected actors who are all trying to give a different take and kind of bring a, a different idea to it. Um, and, and that's my, well, that was ultimately ultimately my goal with it was just to respect the project uh, and to try to bring something a little bit different. Gotham is a very different show than what the Dark Knight was or what the Tim Burton Batman was. And, and all I could really do uh, was to come prepared, uh, care about it, and to try to bring my own ideas. And I, that can be said of, honestly, any role and any project. And I, I think that great... The great actors are at least the people that I admire are the ones that just bring those basic principles to any role. You have to care about it. You have to be present. You have to respect it. You have to come, come prepared, you know? Um, and uh, I mean, I, it was something that I was very excited about, but I was also extremely intimidated. Intimidated? As anybody should be, right? I mean, it, it's it, the last person who played the role had just won an Oscar for it. And gave it an incredible performance that blew me away when I was a kid. You know, that was one of those performances that I watched and I was like, wow, I, I want to be able to do a role like this. I didn't think I was going to do that role, but it, I, I watched it and I was like, this is incredible. This is something that I wanted to do. You know, I think that um, that role has inspired many an actor to, to want to pursue a role to really roles try. like that. Yeah. God, um, <clears throat> it's fantastic. I, 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 it's, it's as good as this whiskey. I didn't realize that this whiskey was going to be as good as it is. Sean, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're, we're definitely keeping this. Um, let's, uh, I brought a couple special things that were bottled before you were born. Okay. I thought it would be fun to... Uh, what is that? Or, or how many years are we talking about? Uh, well, this one's from 1969. Get so out. The liquid's been sitting inside the glass for the past... Do the math. 46, 61 years, something like that. 51 years. The the one that looks like a cologne bottle over yeah, here. This. Yeah. Yeah. So this is old crow. <laughs> this is an old crow traveler. They used to they used to make them for salesmen to fit into their briefcases so that when they traveled, this thing? Uh, when they traveled, you take this off. Yeah. Is it? And oh, it's not even a cork. No, it's a screw top. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. they were meant for your suitcase back in the Mad Men days. Get out of here. This is cool. And uh, yeah, it's been 51 years. Let's crack that one now. Let's clean the palate. Let's get the peat out of our face. I wonder if uh, I wonder if it's lost its proof from sitting in the bottle for so long. That's God. You you really are tipping your hat. <laughs> so uh, yes, that happens quite a bit. It'll drop in proof, but as long as the liquid's clear, it's safe to drink. Okay. Once you start seeing a really really cloudy bottle, that means that proof has dropped so low that the the solids and the esters have solidified, and it's it's not right. You shouldn't drink it. Right. Uh, but knowing that that liquid is clear is a safe sign. And we've already we opened it uh, with a, I think Adam Devine was that who we opened it with? <laughs> Forget who. All right, we'll clean the palate with some bourbon. Clean glass. Is Old Crow still around? Yeah, yeah, but you wouldn't want to buy it. It's a real bottom shelf drink. Oh, okay. Now. Let's talk Cal Kestis. Yeah. So I... I so I, I understand this method now. You wait until I'm liquored up and then you ask me about Star Wars. <laughs> no, no, I understand. Okay. No, I would have saved it for the end just to help <laughs> push it over the edge. I loved, loved the game. 
love that you were in it. Love the potential. Anything Star Wars related, there's a lot of potential. There's a lot of kinetic energy sure. just waiting to be unlocked. Mm. And then a beautiful, about a year ago, a beautiful thing developed called The Mandalorian. Mm-hmm. Right? And it, and it gave us all hope for a better tomorrow. Sure. And again, season two comes and they hit you harder and and we get to see our our, our beloved Rosario Dawson make an appearance mm-hmm. live action. Uh, it's in a great episode. I love a that episode. great that episode. Then the very next one, like the last. Have two you episodes, seen the one that just came out? I no, don't know no, no. when this is going to come out, but the, the most recent episode I just watched it this morning was excellent. Uh, but I'm going to ask it. I, I know the answer, uh, but I'm going to ask because I'm a I'm a good I'm a good interviewer. I'm uh-huh, sure. Suck at Sean Evans. Um, is there hopes? I can't tell you. <laughs> Do you have hopes? I can't tell you. <laughs> Let me ask this. Can't uh, tell. When you first did the role you. of the game <laughs> as Cal Kestis, did you have hopes that it would be turned into more? Uh, oh, no, of course. I mean, it, it's great because Cal Kestis is definitely in canon. Yeah. And yeah, um, they've started to explore um, with characters that are in the game have started to appear in uh, the comics and will probably be branching to other media. Um, I can't say specifically what, what that will necessarily mean for the future of the character, but I want uh, a lot for the future of this character. That's, that's a better way of saying it. We'll keep that one. <laughs> hey, everybody, I want to take a quick moment take a pause in the show and talk to you a little bit about Waterford Irish single malt whiskey. This is an exceptional, different farm to glass, grain to glass, single farm, single origin Irish whiskey that sets itself apart and does everything it can to prove that terroir in whiskey is a real thing. You can check it out at glassrev.com slash Waterford today. Cheers. Um, yeah, I, so many people, as soon as I said you were coming on, of course people talk about Shameless, uh, and, and a lot of people are talking about Ian and Mickey. Um, can, we, can we talk about your, your brief departure and your return? Sure. So uh, I was talking to Bill, Bill Macy, my friend. I don't know if you know that we're, we're close friends now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he told we, me you're, you guys were best friends. Yeah, we're best friends. Uh, so we, I have his email. Uh, we talk. <laughs> uh, but no, he, he was talking about one of, the, one of the things about the show that I think is an important acknowledgement from the viewer's perspective, and that is any show that you have an emotional interest in, a vested interest, when a character is written a certain way that the viewers hate, right? I'll give you an example. Um, I hated... So the first couple seasons, the the figurehead of the family that kept everyone in line, doing what was right, kept the family going, was your older sister, Fiona. Fiona. Sure. So, but then I, I don't remember what season it was because we, it's you know, it's been eleven years, but uh, mm-hmm. three or four seasons in, Fiona's making every mistake in the world, sure. right? And then you hate that because she's supposed to be the one that does it right, mm-hmm. right? So. There was a brief moment where we thought we wouldn't see an end result with Ian and Mickey, and and then I saw that you had left, and then you came back, and and uh, and I'm sure this has been discussed before. So if it's something that you get tired of talking about, we can cut it out. No, I'm just kind of curious what what uh, you had. I think when you announced your departure, you had said you had known for some time that you were planning on leaving, and then you decided to come back. And and as a viewer, I'm thankful you came back because I want to see more or at least some closure in the Ian and Mickey mm-hmm. realm. You know what I mean? Well, I think that I think that there's something before before I directly address that. I think that there's something interesting that you touched on, which is that to me shameless what the show really is about is about mistakes. It's about those decisions that they weren't the best decision to make and you have to kind of own, own up to them because that's what you have to do. And it's sort of the same thing as like family, where you'll have like a family member do something, something that you're like, oh, I hate them. How dare they do that? That's, how did, that's crazy, you know? And then you spend time with them just 15 minutes later, you're like, I love this person so much. You know, I, I could never lose this person. You look past their... You, you look past their faults because that's something that is 
human. It's, it's, it's ultimately one of those things that make us who we are is we all have our mistakes and our faults and our weaknesses. And I think that every character on the show at some point or the other, if they've stuck around for more than a few episodes, have made Horrible dire decisions. mistakes. Yeah, yeah. All yeah, of them. Terrible decisions. Yeah, yeah. It's a show of terrible decisions. And it's, it challenges you at times where I think you're supposed to look at these characters and be like, I don't like what they're doing. I don't like who they are for this moment. But what's amazing, the privilege of the show is that we've been able to continue for so long that you can come around on them in the same way that you can come around to people of like, I don't like the person that you are right now, but you can learn from these mistakes and three or four years from now, I might really respect the person that you've become. And I think that's an interesting journey. Um, but that was a tangent to go back to what you were saying. Um, I think that I left the show um, after being on it for nine years, and uh, there was a, th there was a lot that we had done with the character, but we had lost his primary relationship and sort of the the, the premise of the show, which is the his interactions with the Mickey Milovich Milf sure. character is uh, you know his long term lover on the show, and without that dynamic, we explored. A bunch of other facets of the character which were great to explore but ultimately i was like do we have more story to tell with this guy and i was like well i don't know i think it might be time for me to go and explore other stuff because i've been doing it for nine years and i think that's a respectable time to be doing literally anything, anything. yeah um and then i left and then they they told me that Noel had signed back on the show and that there was something that more that they wanted to explore with the character and i was like okay let's see what you, what you got. And I was really excited to come back and to do um, a couple more seasons because I think that some of the stuff that we've done with the character for the last couple of years have actually been some of the more interesting stuff we've done with the character um, ever. As I, I think that there's, there's, a, there's something interesting about uh, finding a person who has had a life of mistakes but is with somebody who has made far worse mistakes. Oh, horrible ones. Um, and how they protect each other and how they fight for each other and how they've essentially kept each other alive, I think is really fascinating. And now that they've become married, they have these, these levels of responsibility that are just so much more than anything that they could have possibly had before. Well, it, it's, it's both realistic. So there's a couple things that you mentioned I want to touch on. Mm -hmm. You mentioned a show of mistakes and how you eventually come around to rooting for those people again. That's, that's a, a great example of every single character on the show, mm -hmm. right? At times we've, we've hated Frank. And then there are times where we're really, we like Frank, where we think he's showing redeeming qualities, right? That's the, the, the burden of the antihero mm -hmm. is the, <laughs> on paper, this person's a piece of shit. Sure. But there are redeeming qualities and redeeming moments that you, you, especially for family you try to hold on to. Mm. Uh, so that, I agree with you completely. Um, we can move on past that. Let's pour something else. Yeah, let's do it. This was um, not great, by the way. Yeah? <laughs> so I was, I was hoping to get some input here. So uh, the, it, 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 I get it like kind of like a cherry lozenges, like those like throat lozenges. And then I, I can also definitely taste the dust. Like a, like a medicinal, a medicinal, definitely cherry medicinal. Flavor. Yeah. 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 So we, we, uh, me and Todd were talking about this. This is a, a good example of mediocre dusty bourbon, right? Yeah. Dusty bourbon, just being discontinued bourbon. That's not around anymore. Not, not always literally dusty, but, uh, it's not great. I don't think it's bad. I don't think it's, it's not, horrible, but it's not, it's definitely not great whiskey. No. So let's get into some great things. Uh, there is something I did have a touch of left. Um, this Ooh. this puppy right here. So I wanted to save you one pour. All right. So this is another signatory. It's, it's another signatory, but this this isn't available in the U.S. I found it at an auction house while I was hunting for some some gems, and uh, it's an 11 year old single barrel first fill sherry hogs head at 66.2 percent. Uh, it is darker than death, and it is absolutely delightful. So, you got a glass there? So, talk me through that. Uh, sherry Hoggett. So, finished in sherry? No, full matured, 11 years in, okay. a, in a sherry barrel. First fill, meaning okay. that this is the first time it held whiskey in it before that was sherry. 
Uh -huh. uh, a lot of times like these, you see how light that is? That's usually a, a multiple use cask. Right. You know, um, this is first fill sherry, 11 years old, and it'll light your chest up on fire. But I'm excited. Mm -hmm. I also, and I'm sure our viewers are tired of listening it, about it, but I've got a, a bottle here. It's a ginger brandy from 1905. Uh, I had some with, with our dear friend, Bill Macy, best friends. <laughs> uh, we added each other on LinkedIn. And uh, I thought it'd be cool if we shared a pour of it. Absolutely. 115 years old, and it's, it's a cure for diarrhea. So, oh, okay. I don't know what's going on in your digestive system, but <laughs> it'll well, help. Well, after this, we'll have to find out. <laughs> see um, how this the the sixty year old whiskey treats me. Yeah, 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 absolutely. You've played Superboy a couple times. Sure. Uh, how has that experience been? Do you want to do more in the comic book realm? Yeah, I mean, I love the DC animated guys. Um, they're they're great. They're fun. They really allow you to play with a character uh, every time that we come in. Um, it's it, we've done. Uh, I can't necessarily say, but we've done a couple characters, um, and it, it's always a joy to work with these guys. And um, yeah, I, I, I'm excited to work with them in the future. But uh, Superboy was really fun because it's sort of like it's like brash and and silly and and kind of heightened and like he was like the characterization of him in that movie was he learned how to kind of be a person and how to relate to people by watching like 90s sitcoms and stuff so he has this like weird separation with uh like basic human interaction in reality where he's like he's trying to be like uber cool and and, and it, it was um it was just it was fun it was it was nice to be able to play with him um and I, I would like to do more stuff with, with, with DC Animated, but also that character was fun as well. I mean, who knows if they'll ever bring in the live action. But. Yeah, I mean, you, you've, you've dabbled. I say dabbled. Uh, you, you've, you've definitely put your feet firmly in the DC world. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there, would you ever entertain the idea of a live action Superboy? I mean, I guess so. I mean, I mean, that depends on the project more than anything. It's sort of, it's all dependent on what it is, you know. I I I I thought that that um, that part was really fun, but once you're doing something live action, you're canonizing a character in a part, and so you have to make sure that whatever this character is appearing in, it's something that you want to do. Are you that it honors the role, right? I mean, or or is this just like a part that's right for me right now, and does this characterization? interest me yeah you know? yeah i mean I, i'm more along thinking of no one wants to be the batman with nipples right like you don't want to be the one time the sure. one the one project you take on ruins that character for people it's so funny too because one of the weird things about signing on to uh those roles a lot of times is they throw a contract in front of you which is just like uh pair play you're going you're going to appear in three projects and we have someone maybe directing it and someone wrote the script, but it's been touched by 20 other people and it will probably continue to change. And like, they put these contracts in front of you that you're kind of like, I don't know if I want to sign on to this because I don't know what this thing is. And I think that that might've been a case of, of like, I don't know the particulars of like Clooney and, and the Schumacher Batmans and that kind of stuff, but like, a, Joel Schumacher was a really interesting filmmaker prior to, you know, those two movies, which were kind of dis disastrous. B, uh, he just came off, they just came off the Tim Burton movies, which were fantastic and interesting and kind of set the tone for comic book movies at the time. And C, I think that a lot of people probably thought that Tim Burton was still attached to do the third one when <laughs> yeah. they signed on for those contracts. So it's, it's, it's funny that like... They don't give you much to go on. They, not only do they not give you much to go on, but it's a weird thing as an actor a lot of times. You are the face and the figurehead of a bunch of things that aren't in your control, like the director or the producer, or the writer or the editor, something like that. And it, it is kind of one of those things where it's like, there's a lot of stuff that's out of your control, like costume design or hair or something like that, where it might just look strange and people will just be like, oh, he was a terrible whatever, Batman sure. or whatever. And it's like it's of, his fault. Yeah, it's. It, I mean, if it's performance, it could be, but it could also just be that he he has nipples. You know? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> which is probably something he had no control over. No. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's one of those things. Like, I think Nolan, obviously, and and Heath Ledger, those were the Nolan movies were the best Batman movies. Uh, Heath Ledger was the best uh, theatrical Joker. 
Okay. And uh, but I think, and I love Bale, but I thought he was arguably one of the worst Batmans ever. Mm. The the bear voice, the 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 the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The bear with laryngitis no, voice was a, the only thing. I think I'd, it's a solid Bruce Wayne. See, I thought he caught so much shit leading up to it, mm-hmm. but Batfleck, the, the, mm. the, the, the uh, not war torn, but like the scruffed, uh, been through it, mm. Bruce Wayne. Mm. Uh, I, I feel like this is controversial. I feel like Ben Affleck was arguably the best Batman Bruce Wayne combo in the last 30 years. Yeah. I know. I think Keaton is argued as the best. I, I don't. I don't agree. I feel like the war torn. You know what's funny is I always thought Michael Keaton <clears throat> would be an incredible Joker, and it, it was. It's one of those weird things where it's like, why did you cast him as Bruce Wayne? Like he's got that moment where it's like, you want to get nuts? Let's yeah. get nuts! Like he's got that moment. That energy. He, he's got. He's got so much expression to his face, and he, and he, he's got a great voice. And you watch him in like a, a role like Beetlejuice. And it's like, why didn't you cast this guy as the Joker? He's a great, he's, he would be perfect. But anyway, um, I don't know. I think that, I think that Bruce Wayne is one of those roles that I'm, I'm, I think it's kind of like an impossible task because you have to play the world's most handsome and humble man who is a billionaire, but also cares about, you know, uh, poverty and fighting justice. And he, you know, he's like, he's one of those, like the, the hypocrisy of the character is the whole point. And there's no person who's ever going to be able to encapsulate all the dynamics of this character. So you can have someone who's like kind of like broken and dangerous, like Michael Keaton, or you can have, uh, someone who, uh, is, uh, uh, like a more fit and active character like Christian Bale, or you can have uh, the Robert Pattinson seems to be more of like, he's kind of sensitive and intellectual, or you can have like all these different characters. I'm excited to see what he does with it. Yeah, me too. Um, but I think that ultimately it's kind of like one of those roles where I'm not sure you can really you win, can win yeah. in that situation. In comedy, you have the straight man and like you'll, you'll watch a movie like Horrible Bosses and you have like Charlie Day or Jason Sudeikis who are kind of playing like the more slightly absurd characters. And then you have like the Jason Bateman, who's like the, the straight man yeah. in that dynamic. Um, and the best straight man alive. The, the, the Batman is sort of like the ultimate straight man, where he's sort of the guy who is like he's got the absurdity of the world where he's living in, but he's the kind of the the voice of like reason and justice throughout all of it. And I think that there is like an, an incredible talent to be able to play the sh- that that role, which is uh, honestly is why I like I always thought that Batman was one of the coolest characters because. He's the guy who's kind of having to play. I mean, it's weird because he's in a bat suit, so it that is in itself absurd. But for some reason, he is the voice of reason throughout all of this. And I don't know. I I, I personally really like the the Christian Bale um, characterization of it. I I'm not the biggest fan of the voice. I will say the the voice, and I think one of the things that they fixed in the current DC films uh, or the current Batfleck is the mobility in the suit. Mm-hmm. So it makes it easier to for the fight scenes or for the dialogue in the suit to not be so rigid. And I know, just, it's, I, I know it's silly, but I actually kind of like... You prefer the stiff? The, the lack of articulation. There's something really funny about like the, the Michael Keaton... Tim Burton Batman and his like yeah it gave his him shoulders such, like a character to the the way that he moved that I I you couldn't get away with it now that you just straight up couldn't get away with it yeah. but there's a, there's a charm uh, to that I I I really love those movies because you get to see a uh, practical application of effects in a way of like you don't get to see it now of like use of miniatures and matte paintings and and prosthetic work and that kind of stuff that I I personally find really fascinating um and I think that for me the Tim Burton movies might edge out the Nolan ones just because I actually really like watching that stuff in the, in the same way I, I love watching the original Star Wars or something like that. Like I love the craft that went into, that went into it and, and the creativity. I mean, not to get into lofty or, or obtuse territory, but that is sort of what art does. Is Essentially, it kind of creates its own world or its own reality a lot of the time. Like you can look at like a Van Gogh painting and that's not necessarily a representation of life but that is its own unique world within it william shakespeare didn't write 
Shakespeare because that's the way that people talked. They didn't talk in sonnets and, and that stylized prose, but for some reason it, it works because it exists within its own internal logic and its own internal re reality. And understanding tone in the world that uh, a, a character lives in or the wh how a project is made and what its goals are and how it's trying to communicate that to the audience, I think is really important, um, regardless of what form of art it is. And I think that a lot of great actors um, tend to be able to clue in to that tone really quickly and, and be able to um, output in that direction. To, to, to create that, that mm. space. Mm. Um, let's do the rumble next, and then we'll end on this other scotch bottle that has not been opened yet. Love that. So you mentioned you wanted to try Balconies. Yep. Uh, we have you ever been to being a fan of whiskey and it's definitely clear that you are have you ever gone to a distillery in the barrel selection no so one of the most funs you'll have on a day that your schedule's free is traveling to a distillery and them taking you through their warehouse and just rolling out barrel after barrel uh of different profiles different ages different uh <laughs> chars and you just spend the day tasting barrel to barrel and finding the one that you love the most mm. This was a barrel selection we did for the show. Um, we do these quite often with the Houston Bourbon Society. So the, the largest whiskey club in North America is in Houston. It's about 10,000 people. Uh, it's a Facebook group of, of quite a few. So, so this is spe spe specifically for the show? Correct. Right on. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. so we, we went up to the distillery. They rolled out 19 barrels for us. It was an Uber day for sure, mm -hmm. where we, we took an Uber. But, <laughs> um, but they rolled out 19 barrels. This is rumble. It's not quite whiskey. It's not quite rum. It's not quite brandy. It's, it, it exists in a legal space of a, a gray area. Okay. Uh, spent its whole life in an Old Rosa sherry barrel. Nice. So it's a mixture of like... It's made with turbinado sugar, mission sugar figs. Cane. And is there corn in it? Nope. Okay, uh, we, wildflower honey, Texas wildflower honey, turn okay. on sugar and mission figs. And let me go Interesting. Bit here. Yeah, so, and then it spent a few years in an Olorosa sherry barrel. And this is Balcones. Uh, did, did the honey go into it before it was uh, fermented and, and distilled? No, it was distilled with it. It was all distilled together. So the, the turbinado sugar, the mission figs, and okay. the wildflower honey uh, all go into a pot still. They have one of the largest pot stills in Texas. Oh, cool. And uh, it it smells like there's sugar in there, but there's not. It's wild. So it's, oh, it, may, wow. it may not be something you like. I sent Sam Hewen a flask because I wasn't sure he'd like a whole bottle. But it's such a bold, bizarre middle ground of spirit. It's not quite whiskey. Um, yeah. And it's so sweet. It's got that sherry bomb note of like sherry scotch. Oh man, I could do stuff in a cocktail with this. Thing. Oh, this is... oh, dude, uh, you throw some amarino, Amer amarino cherries. Those those dark luxury Luxardo cherries. Yeah, sure. Oh my god, yeah. So uh, we'll do this, and then we'll jump into that last bottle, and then we'll we'll get out of here. Listen, thanks so, again. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Uh, any ch any chance to, especially to drink with someone I know enjoys drinking. <laughs> it's always a a fun side of you. I don't think anyone's seen. Uh, have you ever discussed? No. Have you ever done a podcast before? I've, I've done, not really. <laughs> not really? Uh, have you, you are, I would say, a very serious actor, mm. uh, something that exerts a lot it, of... It's energy. funny because it, it, I actually started in comedy and the first, in the first half of my career was almost exclusively in comedy. I was on Malcolm in the Middle. Oh, I, I click. I love like, Malcolm in the Middle, yeah. yeah it, 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 it's funny. I, I then, I, I pivoted later in my career and everyone thinks I'm like a very serious person, but it's, it's, I actually really enjoy a comedy set. Like I'm, I'm a huge comedy nerd. I, uh, I love stand up. I love improv. So like, that's, that's something that I just, I dig. So. Well, have you thought about like, if you, when you reach out to your agents, you're mm -hmm. like, I want to, I want to do something silly. I want to, even if it's a, a, a yeah. you know, it's always sunny in Philadelphia is a great silly endeavor. I, well, I love it's always sunny. I don't know how much longer it's, it's on the air, but I would love to. I think they just got do, renewed for three more seasons. Oh, no yeah. way. Yeah. Uh, I would, I would love to, you know, not to call it out, but also I would love to appear on that show. That's, that's one of my favorites. But um, 
I, I, yeah, I mean, ultimately it comes down to, for me, I approach stuff from a uh, character more than anything, which is like throw a character in front of me that I find interesting and that challenges me and that I, I think it's like weird or interest, just strange in a way that like I can latch on to. Like there, I tend to make decisions on the stuff that uh, I find intimidating or slightly dangerous. And if, if something is pushing the edge of my comfort zone in some way, I'm going to be more interested in doing it. So if it's, if it challenges me to learn something new or it makes me explore the psychology of something I'm, I'm not necessarily familiar with or something like that, I'm much more interested in doing the role. So, um, if you put a, a comedic character in front of me that I think is just interesting and fun and I can play with then hell yeah, why not? Is there something that you have been kind of, um, champing at the bit uh to to do next i mean as shameless wraps up for an 11th season mm. what's what's next in your ambition um i mean that's it's an open question right now i think the <laughs> kind of the face of media is changing a little bit it's like what is what what are people doing i don't know it's it's um it's an interesting question now that a lot of stuff is coming to to home it's coming to streaming uh limited series are essentially movies now and kind of our, it's like we're existing in a, a wild west territory a little bit of like sure. of what, new media. So I look, there are specific filmmakers that I can say that I would very much want to work with um, like uh, Denis Villeneuve or um, uh, Quentin Tarantino or something like that. But oh like, God. I can't give you a, a specific project because the people that tend to interest me are the ones that do things that are slightly unpredictable or they have that um, just X factor of like, I didn't necessarily see that coming, but there's something about this that I find really interesting. So who knows what the next project will be? Uh, I'm excited to see uh, what happens next. I mean, obviously, uh, Gotham, Shameless, mm -hmm. uh, comedically, you've got the drama thing down. Right, uh, I'm excited to see. I don't have it down yet. I, I, There's a lot more to do. Maybe not perfected, you know. <laughs> but I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm always eager to see what because that's the great thing about Shameless is it's both very dark and very serious at times, and very, pardon my French, but very fucked mm. at times. Uh, but also, it has these moments of complete comedic relief, like mm. just so great. Um, let, let me give you this one pour, and then we'll yes. wrap up here. So I've got uh, a Mortlock. It's an 11-year-old first-use hogshead. So we have two 11s? Yeah, so that is a 5-year-old Punahabin, right? Okay. Yeah, it's only 5 years old. And this this son of a gun was absolutely brilliant. Barbecue in a bottle. Okay, so explain this one to me. So this is Mortlock. Uh, it, it's going to be more on the... Classic Scotch profile, like mm. lots of honey notes that you know that traditional ex bourbon. Is this a space side or uh, Mortlock? I want to say is space side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it is space side single malt, uh -huh. and this is Isla. Yeah, Isla single malt. So see, that's what Signatory does. So here, watch your knee. Signatory basically travels the region of Scotland and finds the cast that they love the most. Mm. There's a um. Wow. There's like a honey finish to yeah, it. Yeah, there's, there's like a it, it kind of tastes like mead to me. There's a there's a ton of sweetness in there, and it's got a layer of smoke right on top. Mm -hmm. It's it's wonderful. Much lighter on the palate. That nose is tremendous. Oh, dude, this is so great. I I, I had no idea you were a, a Scotch guy, um, or a, a whiskey guy. Mm -hmm. I want to ask: Have you had a crazy fan encounter? Worst thing? I've, I, I, yeah, I've had a, I've had a few. I, I, I've had people show up at places where they shouldn't be, um, just you know, like a private residence or something like that. And like to your home? Uh, yes, or, or when I'm tra traveling, it's usually easier to be able to just find a place that I'm going to, and it's sort of like they're, they're look. There's nothing wrong with seeing somebody on the street and, and saying hello to them or, sure. or wanting to talk to them. I think that that's really cool. And if, if you do see me in the street, feel free to be like, hey, I love this thing or I'm interested in this thing or can I ask you a question or something like that. Always exciting. However, 
the rules of how you would regard any stranger on the street should always still apply. So you wouldn't go up to uh, a uh, an office worker or a cop or somebody, I don't know, a, a, a gas station attendant or whatever with your camera out and Already bring it out. out to their face. You wouldn't uh, uh, say that you sucked in something. You wouldn't like, there's less like basic, sure. I think I actually have never had that happen, but but. I have had a number of people who, who that's happened to where they've had horrible things shouted at them in sure. the street. I've had people come t- uh, uh, to my home or place that I've stayed before, and that's like, it's not appropriate. It's not cool. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I you know, th- you wouldn't show up to somebody else, somebody's house un- uninvited. I think that there's just like a, a certain level of respect that, that is appropriate. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I... So nothing too crazy. Well, just a little ru- more ruder and considerate. I, I've had, I've, I've, I've had things. I don't, I don't want to call out anybody in sure, specific because I also, I, 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 generally, if someone does something like that, I, I'm, I'm more like, I don't know what's going on with you, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that that's your situation. Sure. Um, but yeah, I've, 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 I've definitely been followed in a way of like, all right, <laughs> well, listen, thanks so much for doing this. I know we're, we're out of time. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll, I'll pour you the 1905 brandy off camera. Um, again, thanks so much. This thanks, was bro. awesome, man. Appreciate it. Cheers. Balcony's first ever year round bourbon was an inspiration. It all had to work together. A blend of carefully selected ingredients, Texas-sized pot stills, and creative people determined to find the absolute best way to usher a new whiskey along. When you discover how it pairs with a meaningful moment, suddenly the feeling of drinking great whiskey becomes a whole lot more.